with one episode of bad judgment after another, Hillary Clinton's policies launched ISIS onto the world stage. Yet, as she threw the Middle East into violent turmoil, things turned out really to be not so hot. Incident after incident proves again and again Hillary Clinton lacks the judgment, as said by Bernie Sanders, stability and temperament and the moral character to lead our nation. With all the talk at varying levels about putting an end to this diseased animal that is ISIS, we are forced to arrive at the realization where we are likely looking at more years of military conflict overseas. This means real, live American boots on the ground putting themselves in harm's way in service to their country. More than ever before, we will be relying on the men and women who spend years learning their military craft in order to defeat an enemy that seems to metastasize faster than we can come up with new cures. And despite all the talk of drones and long-range weapons, much of that fighting will be at ground level. And those charged with dispatching the enemy will be those who understand the one-on-one -on -one manner of bullet warfare better than any of us could ever imagine. Let's welcome back the former Special Operations Direct Action Sniper who served his time in the 3rd Ranger Battalion, a marksman of unqualified expertise, a confirmed body count in Iraq and Afghanistan of 33 homicidal souls. His new book is entitled Way of the Reaper, My Greatest Untold Missions and the Art of Being a Sniper. Let's welcome Nicholas Irving back to the show. Sergeant, always a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you. And as I look at the new book, here's the word that stood out to me when I saw it, the art of being a sniper. I'm one of those guys that always believes that we don't have jobs. We have a craft that we all yeah. work on if we're really good at it. So what is that art? What is that craft mean about being a sniper? Uh, when it comes down to the craft or the art of it, um, it, it's like Mozart or it's like Beethoven putting together a, a masterpiece. Um, for us, it, it's being a surgeon with bullets, uh, making everything come together. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into placing a projectile, um, you know, over a great distance or into a human body for that matter. Um, for us, it's being a surgeon with bullets. I look at doctors or surgeons. Um, what they do is an art. Uh, it's a craft. It, it takes many, many years to perfect, and it's the same thing as being a sniper or anyone with a job, for that matter, who takes pride in what they do. What is it, then, that you need to overcome, the emotion that you need to get past in becoming the best there is at what you do when you look down a scope and you see a human being at the end of the barrel? Um, it's a shutoff at that point. For us, it's a disconnect. Um, it's no longer a human being at that point. It's a target that's trying to destroy my brothers and sisters on the ground, our innocent people uh, in that country. So it's no longer a person. It, it, it's scum of the earth. It's a, just a regular target. Is that what it means by when I've seen some reviewers who've talked about the book and they have called it unapologetic? Is that mm -hmm. really it right there? Because to be the best, you need to be completely unapologetic about the people that you kill. Oh, exactly. Uh, one of our models is without warning, without remorse. Um, we have no remorse for what we do. Uh, we take out bad guys and we do bad things to bad people. And if anyone comes in contact or, or tries to destroy my brothers and sisters or, or our way of life, I have no issue or the people I work with have no issue um, ending that person's uh, life. Those of you who are the professional snipers, the other soldiers, male and female, those who I talked about just a few minutes ago, who, if we go back into war in a grand scale, are going to be the ones back on the ground level. With all that's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, to get to the point that we are right now, to where we are still looking at two areas of the globe that are completely fractured and continue to kill each other and look to kill us with wanton ease, do you feel personally and do you believe that your cohorts feel that all the training you got to be the best that you can be is wasted? Uh, we do at some, or some points in time. I think right now we're looking at uh, uh, an enemy that we can't really defeat. Um, we're facing someone or we're facing a belief system, a way of life, and you cannot kill a way of life or a religion or a thought process. At that point, it would be called genocide. Um, the ROE, rules of engagement, we should have been able to do what we were able to do or allowed to do uh, back when the war first started. And then rules of engagement and politics got involved, and that stopped us from being able to do our job. And now we have what we have today, which is ISIS. Is that the biggest thing involved here when you talk about the ROE, the rules of engagement, that every time you go back and look at what you did and you go back and see what's happening now and you see the failures and 
every politician talks about we need to do this and we need to do that, that at the end of the day, you go back, if you would have given us solid rules of engagement, left us alone, let us do our damn job, we might not have won this war, but it sure as hell wouldn't be as bad as it is. Exactly. I agree 100%. Um, I did a total of six deployments, and every single deployment that I've been on, our location I was located at, ISIS has now taken over. And I watched each deployment that I've been on, and the rules of engagement slowly become more political to where we can't shoot back. Um, when you take our ability not to shoot at the bad guys, uh, they start to grow a little more. They start to become more confident, be, uh, get more funding, um, and expand to the you know four, uh, four reaches of the globe. And I think that's what happened now not allowing men and women to do our job on the ground. History tells us that ISIS began with Al-Qaeda, with the fracturing of Iraq, with the fact that we went in in the first place, and we were not prepared and did not have a complete plan to go in, get the job done, and walk out. Yet there are those today, Sergeant, who still say that someone else founded ISIS, that President Obama founded it, that Secretary of State Clinton founded it. What do you think when you hear those things? Um, they weren't there on the ground uh, when we were over there fighting. Uh, Al-Qaeda, or what is ISIS today, those are the, the renegades. The, uh, we killed all the dumb ones. The, the smart ones are the ones that, you know, what we call ISIS now today. Um, they left that region, uh, expanded, started up a, a new organization, had a little bit more funding. Um, ISIS came from the guys who were shooting up, uh, you know, doing bad things to us. Um, they just grew a little bit more, and, and now we have what we have today. Do you just think to yourself sometimes how ridiculous it is that here we are just screaming and whining and, and, and arguing with each other about, about who founded ISIS when, in essence, we're still not doing enough and not doing the right things to get to them? It, it, that's got to that's just gnaw at you, the fact that we're stuck in this ridiculous argument. Oh, yeah, you hear all the, the arguments about where it came from. Uh, there needs to be more than just an argument about where ISIS uh, originated. Let's go over there and take care of it. Uh, we don't need a large scale force. Uh, my unit, we only deployed about 35 guys at a time and we would average somewhere between 2,000 to 4,000 kills per, per 90 days. Uh, let guys like us go over there and do it. You have SEALs, you have the Marine Force Recon guys, you have Army Rangers, the 75th. Uh, there's so many you know, special operations unit out there that uh, are really good at what they do and it takes small numbers and it does not have to be publicized, it does not have to be on the news. We just go over there and take care of business and come back home. I got 30 seconds. You're sitting across from the next president of the United States. You have 30 seconds to tell them exactly what to do to start winning this war. What do you tell them? It doesn't take 30 seconds. All I would say is cut the chains loose. Let us do our job. And you are completely confident that the men and women who are there right now and are trained would take that, they would do their job, and this war might not be over, but it would sure be different, right? way different and it would strike the fear in the uh, new up and coming members of ISIS or whatnot, whatever the new organization may or may not be, but it would sure strike fear in them. Whoever the next president is going to be, get this guy and his friends to get in front of your face uh, or do yourself at least a beginning here. Check out the new book, Way of the Reaper, My Greatest Untold Missions and the Art of Being a Sniper, because these are the men and women that do put their lives on the line every single day. They are unapolog unapologetic, I should say, in the manner in which they defend this country. Nicholas Irving, it's always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll look forward to talking to you again. Those are the men and women we need to get behind and the one that a new president needs to listen to. Rock on, true believers. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night and good luck. Thank you.